Jacobs. Um, Robert Walters is also going to be speaking. He is also from Pillsbury Winthrop. And um, I've been told that this is not going to be a point counterpoint um, discussion, but um, if it were going to be that, it would be even more fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, we may break into that at some point. Right, and um, they're going to be talking about the, the um, prominent and somewhat sometimes somewhat controversial uh, recommendations that the investigation by the FTC and DOJ of the patent system uh, yielded a few months back. So with no further ado, welcome. Well, thank you. Rob and I are going to walk through the recommendations of the FTC with some level of critical analysis. And, and there will be some back and forth. Rob and I are both patent litigators, although we both have done counseling, prosecution, and the whole spectrum of patent work. We've also done a lot of copyright and trademark work as well. So we have a natural predisposition towards arguing with each other. And uh, I imagine on a Friday afternoon, we've spent a couple of hours today digging in once again, looking at the 300 pages uh, put forth by the FTC. We can certainly agree to disagree on a number of different uh, controversial aspects of the report. But Rob and I are not antitrust lawyers. We come at this from the patent perspective. We view it as an attempt to modify a system that has been in existence for a long time. And we want to kind of analyze the recommendations with the underlying understanding being that this is the FTC. And the FTC's bent when they come forward and look at issues like this they're going to start out from a competitive analysis viewpoint, and they're going to be looking at this from ways in their mind to make the system more competitive. And as we'll talk about, that's what the joint hearings were all about. To those of you who do not know exactly what we're talking about, there was, for quite a while, in 2002, there were hearings that the FTC held, and they had 300 panelists. They had many, many days of testimony. They had over 100 written submissions from patent experts around the country. And the key question was whether the patent system is in balance with antitrust competition policy. And that question is focused on throughout the FTC report. It's all about, is the patent system encouraging innovation? And the recommendations that they make, in their view, are ways to improve ways that the patent system can promote innovation. And one thing the FTC looked at was not only the current state of patent practice before the PTO, but they also analyzed the PTO's own strategic plan of the 21st century, which laid out a number of initiatives that, that the PTO wanted to implement. And as you'll see today in the discussion, the, the FTC approved some of those Right, and, and what we'll try to do as well as we go through this is a, a number of the issues that the Patent Office has already considered, and there's a 21st century strategic plan that the Patent Office put forward, are amplified and accepted by the FTC and the FTC's recommendations. So a number of times, the FTC makes a recommendation that they believe will assist the system, but the recommendation has already been accepted by the Patent Office. And at this point, it's procedural as to how it will be implemented. What we want to talk about is why these recommendations are being made, again, in our viewpoint, and what their possible impact will be on the system. And there are pros and cons to each one of the recommendations, and we'll highlight those as well. Anybody who wants to jump in and weigh in on any of these, please feel free. An open discussion would probably be best, but we'll try to keep each other honest to the extent that we can. The report came out October 28, 2003. An interesting aspect of it is there's a second report that's forthcoming. And the second report is going to make recommendations to the antitrust community for maintaining a proper balance with the patent system. Now, nobody really knows exactly what that is or what it means. It'll be very interesting. And also, there have been no specifics. There are some meetings going on in April and May where certain issues that have been recommended here are going to be further discussed out in Santa, in Santa Clara. Uh, but there's no indication as to when this second report is coming forth. 
Each one of the recommendations will require either legislative, regulatory, or some type of judicial change. And we'll try to highlight as we walk through them what it will take in order for these changes to be implemented. Because every one of them requires some type of different motivation. Rob, why don't you kind of walk through some of the, the issues that led to sure. the report? In the, uh, in the course of the 300-page report, there are a couple of themes that emerge over and over again and, and which really appear to, to be the, the primary motivators for the FTC to undertake this analysis of the patent system. And the first one is the proliferation of business method and other internet software patents. Now, in my view, the, what's behind this really is uh, an expectation that the Lemelson model of, uh, of, of obtaining broad patents and then suing, uh, suing broad uh, swaths of industry and then obtaining uh, a number of settlements uh, and, and, and really increasing the cost of, uh, of competition across a wide part of the economy uh, is, is what the FTC was concerned with. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, there are a number of sort of Lemelson imitators out there. There are the CATS patents that deal with methods of uh, paying uh, over the internet. There are also the net money patents, which are, are somewhat similar. There are the Solaya patents that deal with process control uh, machinery. And, and all, all three of those entities, uh, the CATS, uh, the net money people, and Solaya, have undertaken somewhat Lemelson-like strategies of, uh, of suing numbers of parties and, and trying to seek relatively small settlements from, from each of them. Uh, and, and in the course of, of doing that, obviously, they're increasing the cost of, uh, of doing business in those, in those industries. Rob, why don't we step back for a second. The Lemelson-like strategy that Rob is talking about, it's very, very uh, ingenious if you don't know exactly what he's talking about. What Jerome Lemelson did was he filed patent applications a long, long time ago and received a fundamental patent. It related to barcode scanning. And, and what he did was, through a process of filing numerous continuations where he kept the patent alive and he kept refining the scope of his claim, he waited until the industry, until everybody started doing what he was able to capture by broadening his claims through this expanded continuation practice. And then after, and, and he, he didn't have to publicly disclose this the whole time that he was doing it. After everybody started using this technology, then he surfaced, and the, uh, the name submarine patent has been given to what Lemelson coined. Uh, he surfaced, and he sent letters out to everybody in the world saying, why don't you take a license from me? Litigation is costly. I have this technology that covers what you're doing, but I'm willing to settle with you on very reasonable terms. Yes. Isn't 20 year term and uh, publication after 18 months supposed to be some solution to the Lemelson problem? And did the FTC give any, any recognition to that? A absolutely. And, and the FTC actually adopts the 18 month recommendation. But as you know, about 10% of all applications don't have to be published if you make certain exceptions. So, as we'll see, what the FTC says and what the Patent Office has previously said is, Every, let's make everything public after 18 months. And we were talking about that earlier today. If, if everything is made public, I, I think it's going to be a lot harder for people to come forward and say, you know, oh, you broadened the scope of, of your patent claims through this continuation process. And it, it, you're on notice. Once you're on notice through public issuance, I think that, in fact, you're going to have a very difficult time making the types of latches arguments that we've seen and have kind of evolved over the last uh, couple of years. And Lemelson's patent, as a matter of fact, just so we tell you, was finally taken to task out in Nevada. It was uh, about, what, about uh, five or six months ago. Yes. And it was finally invalidated. But we're talking about years and years of litigation and, and, and hundreds of millions of dollars flying. And I think Lemelson's foundation was worth over, it was over $2 billion at one point in time, I had heard. And this was all done through uh, these, this core set of patents that he had. So, so when Rob says the, the Lemelson-like strategy, it's a strategy that in the patent world, everybody has 
seen and it's been something that has really been at the forefront of our consideration. It's over an the last ingenious strategy and it, it, it made a tremendous amount of money for the Lumbleson Foundation and, and their attorneys, to, to say the least. I should also add that we'll get to another recommendation in the course of our speech that also approaches the problem of submarine patents and proposes intervening rights which would arise if claims are broadened uh, after an initial publication uh, and, and, and a company has, has uh, invested in, in production uh, assuming that the, that the patent is limited to the, to the less broad scope, but we'll explain that in a bit. Uh, I also wanted to add that with respect to, to net money, CATS, and, and Solaya, the FTC has actually invented a term to describe the, the, this type of entity, and they call them NPEs, or non-practicing entities. That is, an entity that just that acquires patents, obtains them, and enforces them, but is not practicing those patents, is not producing products or using the patents in a, uh, in a productive way uh, other than to... Uh, to uh, obtain uh, revenue through litigation and the threat of litigation. So licensing is not considered productive then? I mean, thinking about companies like uh, Rambus, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that, that's an interesting point, and certainly, certainly that is an example of a, of a non-practicing entity that has a little bit of a different strategy. Uh, and of course, there's licensing, and then there's licensing. There's the Lemelson kind of licensing, where it's, you know, some have, uh, uh, have likened it to blackmail, but, uh, you know, then there's the other kind of licensing, which is defensive licensing, and you know, I, I probably shouldn't draw a moral judgment like that, but uh, uh, in any event, uh, uh, I think licensing is, is an example of, uh, of a non-practicing non entity that may have a more productive uh, aspect to it. Then the other theme that, um, oh, I guess we, did we skip? Uh, I'm sorry, you want to go back on? Right, the, the other theme that, uh, that appears frequently in the report is the costly nature of litigation to invalidate patents. And, and the FTC takes the viewpoint that, that overly <coughs> broad patents are bad. I think everyone would agree with that. And then the FTC looks at, you know, how does one go about invalidating overly broad questionable patents? And the usual process, of course, is litigation in the district courts. That is tremendously expensive. It takes a long time. It's also, if you were in uh, Judge uh, Rader's uh, uh, discussion today, it's also somewhat unpredictable because one never knows what the claim construction is going to be, and that, that of course, plays, uh, plays a big role in all this. Uh, there is a, an existing alternative to, to try to invalidate a patent, and that's the reexamination process before the PTO. But that's limited. There are only certain grounds for which you can seek a reexamination. Uh, and the, the perception is that the process is not all that useful to a petitioner seeking a reexamination, that the chances of success are not that good because often it's not. The reexam goes back to the same examiner who issued the patent in the first place. So one of the themes we will see throughout our discussion is ways in which the FTC proposes that patents can be invalidated through different procedures that they propose to implement. Procedures so, which will be more effective and less costly. So, 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 in sum, what the FTC is saying is that there are questionable patents out there. The word questionable patents appears constantly throughout the FTC report. So that's number one in their mindset. Questionable patents affect competition, according to the FTC, because somebody has a patent that they probably weren't entitled to, and they're running around taking advantage of it in the marketplace. And so the FTC says, well, how can we get at the questionable patents? How can we eliminate them so that we are improving competition? And that's where they start to jump into a number of these different, how do you invalidate a patent? Should we make it easier to invalidate a patent? And, and a number of the recommendations deal with exactly that. Yes? I don't mean to be overly simplistic, but it would seem that the first place they would look if there are too many overbroad patents being issued is the PTO for issuing the overbroad patent as yeah. opposed to ways to invalidate it. No, I think that you're right, and they, they touch that, but only peripherally. I mean, most practitioners that you talk to, that's where they go, and they say, <coughs> let's get, you know, get better resources, let's consider a second set of eyes on complex technology and things of that nature. And, and they touch upon that, but they do it in a very, very simplistic way. They say, 
the Patent Office has talked for 20 years about a need for dramatically increased resources. They need more examiners, and we fully support that. That's one of our recommendations. But they're coming at it. That's one of the, one of the key things that you get from it when you read it. They're coming at it from an antitrust spin rather than from a patent spin. And so they're really focused on this aspect of what's fair and not fair with regard to innovation. Yes. Um, I just came from the patent office about a month ago, and that this report uh, has gotten to some of the um, uh, art units, and in particular the biotech art unit, and they've already got the message about having another set of eyes. So just recently, at least this art unit where there's some more complex cases, they've instituted a procedure where there's a panel of three more patent attorneys, or examiners, that, um, that don't include the original examiner to look at cases that are allowed before they go out the door. So this, this report has already affected the patent office in, in certain parts of the patent office. And for everybody's information, the Patent Office implemented in 2000 a requirement that any business method patent, which is a method of performing a certain aspect of business, receive a second set of eyes review. And that was, the, that was kind of the impetus for should we have a second set of eyes looking at more applications. We had heard that the biotech area was one, and they've talked about other areas as well where they might start implementing a second set of eyes. And I know that the Patent Office is behind that, but it's a resource question to a great extent, and they're already overtasked. Uh, speaking of resources, did the report mention anything about fee diversion? Uh, support uh, keeping all the fees at the PTO? The, or there is some discussion about the historical uh, problem and uh, uh, fees being diverted, and, and one of the recommendations we'll see is that they, they propose that the funding of the PTO be increased fairly dramatically in order to allow better examination, uh, some other procedures uh, that they'd like to be implemented, and, and so on. But the fee diversion debate, which is a long time, ongoing debate, is, is not addressed from a, it, would this be a positive thing or a negative thing, it's just discussed in, in kind of the background context. Great. Well, Blair was talking about uh, some of the um, the perspectives from which the FEC uh, views uh, these issues, and, and we have here uh, some key assumptions of the report. The FTC, of course, is primarily concerned with, with competition and anti antitrust, and, and not patents as such, except as they affect these other issues. But the FTC, in our view, approaches the patent issue with the assumption that when courts favor patent rights, they disfavor antitrust rights. There has been a, a, a long-running tension between antitrust law and, and patent law. Uh, for, for many years, antitrust law perhaps had the upper hand. In the 1950s, you had a number of cases, the, the Zenith case in the Supreme Court and many others, where it was, it was very difficult to enforce patents without running afoul of, of, of antitrust principles. The, the, uh, uh, the uh, patent pools, uh, the licensing uh, policies were restricted because they were found to be anti-competitive and a number of other things. The patent misuse doctrine was very strong and, and antitrust in general was very strong. That has changed, of course, since the 50s and the pendulum has swung in the other direction. Many people see the, the federal circuit as being relatively uninterested in antitrust law as such and, and favoring stronger patent protection. In fact, the genesis of the federal circuit uh, really came out of a concern that, that patents need to be strengthened. Part of that was, of course, harmonizing patent law across the United States, taking the jurisdiction from the various regional circuit courts, putting it into the federal circuit so that you would have consistent and, and uniform uh, application of patent law. Of course, I'm not sure we've seen consistent and uniform application of patent law because you've got, you've got the issue that uh, was discussed with Judge Rader regarding the uh, the, the the fact that different panels of the Federal Circuit seem to see things somewhat differently. But in any event, the Federal Circuit generally is, is uniform in its treatment of antitrust law, and the Federal Circuit seems to see, see that as secondary. The Federal Circuit has, I think, clearly strengthened patent rights in the United States and has clearly given an advantage to patent holders uh, in comparison to the situation before the Federal Circuit was in existence. So there are concerns at the FTC and in other, uh, in other agencies that the courts and Congress have built up the patent system to the point of stifling competition. And the, the, the underlying premise is that 
too many patents and patents that are too strong inhibits innovation. Now I think one could perhaps question that premise. One could perhaps ask, well, isn't designing around part of innovation and isn't, isn't having to design around patents something that, uh, that, that spurs new technological developments? Uh, and, and I think it is. So I think this is, it, it's far from clear whether uh, assumption three is, uh, is actually accurate. Well, but one thing that's clear, statistical studies show that patents are being invalidated at a much more rapid rate pre-1982. So law has, since the Federal Circuit came into being, and I think Judge Rich was probably at the forefront of this, has become pro-patent to the point where the numbers of patents being invalidated are, are very, very slim. You put on top of that that if you're going to try to invalidate a patent through litigation that you're looking at a lot of money, you know, a couple million dollars possibly to try to get to the point where you can ultimately invalidate it and it becomes a very, very difficult task from somebody who has an interest in possibly getting rid of what they believe to be a questionable patent. Uh, the Supreme Court said, it was like in 50, 1950 or 60, that the only patent that the Supreme Court would not invalidate would be one that wasn't presented to them. So they were invalidating <laughs> patents you know, right and left. And, and, and one of the problems that people saw was you know, clearly having the different federal, so different circuits around the country looking at these issues, there was no fixed message. And so clearly the federal circuit has, I think, presented a fixed message with regard to unifying the practice but at the same time, in doing that, the FTC's point is that they think that they have strengthened patent rights to the point where potentially invalid patents cannot feasibly be challenged. But then doesn't that also presume that, that the claim interpretation that they're doing is of similar scope? I mean, you know, what, what the, the Federal Circuit could be doing as a balancing act is, is leaving patents as valid and narrowing the claim scope so that they don't, so that the accused product doesn't. A absolutely. I, I mean, I think that that's... I guess it, it seems like if that's the only finding they made, it's missing it. Well, it's part of it. I mean, as you'll see when we get to the burden discussion for, as to what the burden not to be for invalidating patents, mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's a separate issue that's occurred you know, outside of the context of the Federal <laughs> Circuit. But, but clearly the Federal Circuit can, in narrowing the scope of claim coverage, preserve the validity of the patent and, and it'll, it'll improve the, the true meaning of the patent as far as infringement is concerned. You'll know better you know, where, where you stand. And there's some benefit to that as well. The, you know, the real problem is where the invalidity charges are, are, are dismissed or, or thrown out uh, as non-meritorious before the Federal Circuit even gets a chance to really take a shot at them. And you know, that's an expensive process to even get to that point as well. So, so there are some interesting recommendations that focus on how can we improve the system of challenging the validity of patents with the presumption being that there are invalid patents out there that aren't being challenged because people don't want to spend three to five million dollars or whatever the incredible cost and in, you know many years is to try to invalidate them. And much of the FTC's concern with overly broad patents is directed to areas of new technology. And, and part of this is a reflection of the experience with business method patents where the PTO had great difficulty in examining those inventions because there, there was not the appropriate kind of prior art. It was difficult to find out exactly what had been done, and so a number of patents were, were issued that I think most would agree should not have been. All right, so I guess with that, we'll launch into the specific recommendations, and let's continue to chat about them as we move forward. The first recommendation that the FTC puts forth is creating a new administrative procedure that will allow validity to be challenged through an inter partes process at the patent office. Currently, there are ex parte ways of challenging patents through re-exam at the patent office. That, those may only deal with issues of patentability. There was a lot of discussion during the FTC hearings where practitioners were saying, we want to be able to challenge written description. We want to be able to, to, ch to challenge enablement and issues of this type, but the current process for challenging validity through re-exam at the patent office does not allow that. So that was one of the big motivating factors that the FTC focused on. They also focused on 
this would be, in their mind, a cost-effective alternative to litigation for testing validity. And we'll, we'll challenge that assumption you know, as we move forward. But their point was, let's do it in a small, couple of month controlled process where we control witnesses, we control discovery, and we have some type of arbitrator or some type of technical specialist in the end serve as administrative law judge and determine whether the patent is legal or not, whether it's valid. Now those of us who have been involved in litigation for a long time kind of you know, chuckle at that as being cost effective because it, it certainly will be exploited as much as it can possibly be exploited by the people who are involved in the process. It may turn into a situation like you have at the ITC where you have six months to deal with the patent but people work around the clock for those six months and it's an incredibly expensive process in all honesty. They don't make any type of substantive recommendations with regard to how are we going to implement this cost-effective alternative for testing validity? And, and, and it just seems as if they haven't really thought it through because there's not anything cost-effective about taking witnesses and discovery and these other types of things and that you're going to see. Expert discovery and expert witnesses, which would be a part of this, always expensive. Right. They also looked at the fact that inter-part A inter re-exams are allowed now, inter-part A being that you get to participate during the re-exam, but only four to their research have been, have been taken forward since 1999. So people aren't doing it. And they discussed a number of reasons why people weren't taking advantage of the inter-part process. But bear in mind, the inter-part process as it is now, it's a paper exchange. There, there are no live witnesses. There's nothing of that nature. It's every time the patent holder responds to discussion regarding patentability, the person who invoked the re-exam is able to provide a written response to that. So it's, it's a big paper game right now. More often than not, what we're seeing is ex parte re-exams, and ex parte re-exams, in their view, are not sufficiently allowing people who want to challenge the validity to challenge the validity. One of the points that they raised was that the ex parte re-exams, when they're filed at the patent office, are more often than not considered by the same examiner who heard and saw, had the application the first time through. And so uh, in their view, it, more likely than not, the examiner is going to uh, affirm his earlier findings with regard to patentability. And so that's, a, that's, a, that's an assumption that is probably flawed at some level. But it, it, on the other hand, it, it merits some consideration. I mean, it depends on who you're dealing with, probably, in all honesty. It's also interesting to note that the proposal is that one of these procedures could be initiated by any third party. There's no requirement in the proposal that there be a case in controversy as there is for a declaratory judgment action. And so uh, the, these proceedings could, uh, they could be very popular. I think it's easy to imagine that uh, uh, a company in a particular industry uh, becomes concerned about uh, a patent that hasn't been asserted against them and, or, or perhaps a number of patents and perhaps as a matter of policy they decide that every year they're going to file 10 or 15 of these opposition proceedings. I mean, it's just, this, could, this could multiply into, uh, into quite, a, uh, quite an interesting business for a patent attorney. It, it, it will also provide kind of a natural offshoot from litigation because anybody who gets sued in a patent litigation matter would be foolish not to take advantage of a process like this because number one, more likely than not, you'll be able to stay your litigation during the process of the re-exam. And that's, that's very important because you then can gather facts and do other things that you need to during that process. But number two, which we'll deal with later, the, the burden for demonstrating validity at the patent office on a re-exam is preponderance of the evidence. So if you file this quasi action and go to the patent office, you're trying to demonstrate by a preponderance of the evidence that the patent is invalid. If you opt to stay in district court and to try to invalidate the patent there in front of a jury or in front of a judge, it's clear and convincing evidence. And the clear and convincing evidence standard is a very, very high standard that is difficult to overcome when you put on top of it the fact that patents are presumed to be valid. So you have a presumption of validity and you have to demonstrate that it's not valid by clear and convincing evidence, a very, very high threshold to satisfy. So you're going to have, as soon as 
a cease and desist letter comes in or as soon as a suit is filed, anybody is going to be running off to the patent office and filing this inter parte re-exam challenging uh, the validity. It's, it yeah. probably gets drafted before the answer. It probably gets drafted <laughs> if, if before the answer because you want to be able to say in your answer, and by the way, I'm moving to stay everything here because the patent office is assessing the validity of the patent. So it's more work for patent lawyers, uh, no question about that. Is it in the best interest of uh, clients? That is a, a much more difficult call. There's no question about that. It's, it, there are some tendencies here that could be abused. Are they proposing any kind of time limit for an opposition period? They, they, they are. They, they put forth as a suggestion a six-month period. However, part of the problem is they don't lay out exactly what will take place with a nice schedule. They just say <laughs> there'll be discovery that will be allowed um, if necessary. There'll be witnesses if necessary, and it's, it's very vague. Are they proposing a time period in which you would have to file it, or could you file it at any time during the life of the patent? You, you, you can file it at any time now, and you'd be able to file at any time under the, under the proposed new, new, new game as well. And could multiple parties kind of gang up on the same patent? Multiple parties could gang in, up in different proceedings. Abs kind of absolutely, and the FTC says that it's going to get involved in requesting re-exam more often when they view patents to, in existence to be anti-competitive in some so if you way. You have a solo inventor out there with a patent yes. issue that hasn't yes. uh, contacted anybody. All of a sudden, uh, he or she could be looking at a lot of costs just to. That's clearly a, one of the. A, potential as you'll see, one of the one of the major arguments against this are, is that a big company like Microsoft, for example, could take a strategy to kill an independent inventor and get a li force a license, basically, you know, through through rallying forces to invoke these inter parte uh, re-exams. That, that's that's clearly that's clearly a con. They discuss that in the report and they dismiss it and say something to the effect of, you know, that's part of business or so, I mean, you know, something something of that nature. Yes. Well, to argue for, well, I guess against inter parties, the, if the standard in the inter parties re exam is uh, uh, proponents of the evidence, if you pull out your, your best guns, your best prior art, and it, it, you don't meet the burden, and you can't then say in, in court, well, now the standard's even higher. I haven't met it at the lower standard. That's a troublesome yeah. situation. Yeah. Yeah. So a stop. There are, there are yeah, estoppel yeah. So, concerns, so absolutely. You might not ever file wait till it, you really have to do it? Well, it, it depends. You know, if you think that the preponderance of the evidence standard is going to benefit you, you could. You could also, uh, in a case that I recently tried, we had seven different grounds for invalidating. I mean, you ought to try to, in three weeks, tell a jury seven different reasons why a patent is invalid. They don't buy that. So, you know, they just think you're throwing everything up against the wall and seeing what's sick. I could break three of those out and take three of them to the patent office, the best mode, written description, and enablement. Get that running at the patent office, try to stay or not try to stay, and then run forward with regard to my 102 and 103 uh, in, you know, validity challenges in, in court. You're not going to have the estoppel effect if that's the strategy that you take. Clearly, if you only have one piece of prior art and it's a killer piece of prior art, you know, I don't know that I would recommend going forward with an inter parte process because if you don't succeed, you can't honestly stand up in front of a jury and tell them that it ought to be, you know, invalid with a higher standard applying. I mean, it just would never work. But I, it, it'll certainly require some thought. And, and everybody should understand, this is happening. I mean, this is not just an FTC recommendation. As we'll to get to it again, this, the Patent Office has already said this is part of the Patent Office's plan. The Patent Office is going to do this. And the Patent Office is, th is the initiator to this. The FTC just bought on to it as part of their analysis of what would make the system more competitive. Now, the Patent Office has laid it out a little bit differently. The Patent Office has said that discovery in these things will be uh, will be allowed if it's necessary. You know, like when is discovery necessary? I mean, that, that'll be really interesting <laughs> to see how these things play out and how they evolve. But but this this is coming and it's going to happen soon. It's already in Europe in Japan as we as we mentioned and they indicate that the process is about five to six months in Europe, uh, in Germany and specifically I had seen a report. Uh, so we're not looking at this 18 month period where everything will be shut down and you'll have all types of, uh, all types of problems back at, back at the house with regard to what's going on and, and indecision and things of that nature. Let, let's turn to the cons. And there certainly are you know, some cons. I mean, abuse and harassment. I mean, 
it's very possible that you're like Rob said, you, you pick 15 a year and you just go out and you, you know, you get rolling. If you're not involved in litigation, what's the harm? I mean, we're talking with people already in, in different industries who are considering let's just go out and, and try to police different industries. We think that there are some overbroad patents that are laying out there. Let's, 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 let's put up a task force together and start policing the industries. And, and so this could be something that is heavily abused. Also, the concept of an administrative law judge and circumscribed discovery and those types of things uh, are very, very expensive. And I think that it's going to increase the average cost of obtaining a patent uh, significantly if you have to factor in that a certain percentage of your portfolio is going to be affected by this new process. And so, to, uh, to get back to an earlier point on this, it's not entirely clear that this is going to be cost effective and much less expensive. I mean, look at interferences, okay, and this would be, I suppose, in some ways similar to discovery and an administrative law judge. Interference is, is, can be very expensive, in some cases almost as expensive as district court litigation. And so. It, I think it remains to be seen whether this really is going to be cost effective, and it also remains to be seen whether it's going to be a tool that could be used to drive up the cost of enforcing patents, enforcing legitimate and valid patents. It could just become a barrier to that. The, the Patent Office has, over the past years, been getting less and less and less enthusiastic about it, ever initiating an interference. Why are they getting more and more and more enthusiastic about uh, I think this is a response to, to the, the large concern in the public about things like the overly broad business method patents and perhaps the Limbleson situation. I'm, I'm not really sure the, the exact motivation for the patent office, but they, they have bought under the concept and of course the FTC likes it quite a bit as well. It fits more in the traditional agenda of the FTC, I think. For, from what I saw, the patent office's view was we already have an inter parte re-exam process in place. It's, it's, not, it's not working. That process is, 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 is flawed for a number of reasons. But we decided back, you know, a couple of years back that it was something that was very helpful. So let's figure out a may, way to make it work. And, and so this process of allowing uh, testimony and cross-examination and things of that nature, they believe will be something that will be utilized more. And they're definitely right on that. It'll be utilized more than four times in, in four years. And uh, whether or not it'll work is interesting. There's also in both the PTO's report and in the FTC report, uh, a threshold requirement mentioned that, and it probably is a good idea to think about it, where you'll have a certain threshold requirement that'll have to be satisfied uh, so that people are not allowed to go forward with uh, spurious uh, challenges. And I haven't seen anybody mention it, but we were talking before with Jason, um, who had presented earlier today, and he mentioned some fee uh, sharing provisions, which might be helpful if somebody goes forward on an inter parte re-exam and they're not successful, the validity of patent is upheld, it would make sense that you'd be able to recover your fees that you had to put forth into defending the validity, and it would certainly make people think twice before they came out of the closet looking to, uh, you know, looking to, to get you involved in these things. And other, otherwise, we don't see enough to stop people from her abusing this. So it seems like this is kind of a reactionary recommendation to, effect, to address previously issued uh, overly broad patents. Yes. But what about, I mean, did they suggest in this report maybe something parallel to this, like a pre-issue opposition like what is done in Europe as well? Well, there, there was some discussion of, uh, of pre-issue opposition, and the conclusion of the FTC was that that would be an opportunity for abuse, and that they, they see that it, it, as more of an abuse if uh, another party can come in and prevent the patent from ever issuing. So they'll allow it to be issued in a <laughs> yes, overly yes. broad state, but they'll fix it in the end. <laughs> That's right. Now, as, as we will see, there are some other recommendations that attempt to address the problems of overly broad patents issuing. And, and so that, that, that issue hasn't been ignored. The, the, this just isn't the fix for that one. Rob, let's move to the second recommendation, uh, if we can. There we go. Sure. Um, as we mentioned earlier, one of the, one of the themes that uh, appears again and again in the report is that invalid patents should be eliminated and, and it should be cost effective to do so. And, and one of the problems that the FTC identifies is the standard of proof for showing in a district court that a patent is invalid. 
And that standard of proof, of course, is that it must be shown by clear and convincing evidence. And there was a presumption that an issued patent is valid. Well, the FTC is, is, is troubled by that. And, and they point out that the, the standard of proof required to get a patent issued is not clear and convincing evidence. The standard of proof to get a patent issued is simply that the, the, the patent office has to not succeed right, in, in its efforts to show that the patent is unpatentable. I'll try to explain that a little differently. The burden in the prosecution stage is really on the patent office. And if the patent office cannot show by preponderance of the evidence that the invention is unpatentable, then it will issue. So a low standard, the burden is not on the applicant. And then we go to the district court. And in the district court, the burden is, of course, not on the applicant to show invalidity. That's the defendant's problem, or the patent. It's not on the patentee, it's the defendant's problem. But the defendant then faces the burden of showing by clear and convincing evidence that the patent is invalid. And the FTC looks at that and says, well, you know, th this is unbalanced, right? It's a lot easier to get a patent than it is to show that it's invalid. Now, wh why does the presumption exist? The presumption exists because there's deference given to the patent office as an administrative agency. Deference is given to the patent office's examination of the invention and its conclusion that, that a patent should issue. And so the court respects that and, and, and gives a higher burden to the defendant to, to overcome that. And that, and that, that seems fair. But, when, but again, when you look behind the surface of this and you see, well, what, what burden was, was applied in issuing the patent, then there does seem to be an imbalance. And so the FTC proposes that the burden for showing invalidity be reduced to preponderance of the evidence. And that's a, that's a fairly earth-shaking proposition there. That's certainly patent law for many, many years has, has, has held that the burden to show invalidity is, is clear and convincing evidence, and we're all used to that and comfortable with it. Uh, this, would, this would potentially cause a number of changes and, and fundamentally shift the, uh, the advantage, perhaps, from, from the patentee, where the FTC thinks it is, to perhaps more in between or, or maybe, more in favor of the, uh, maybe more in favor of the defendant. And so what are the, uh, what are the pros in doing this? Uh, as we mentioned before, the FTC is very concerned with eliminating patents of questionable validity. This would certainly help with that. The current high standard does undermine the courts and the jury's ability to weed out questionable patents. I think that's, that's true. And finally, uh, the FTC finds that, that changing the standard would promote consistency by making the standard in the district court consistent with the PTO's ex parte reexamination standard. I didn't mention this yet, but when you go back for reexamination, right, after the patent's issued, the standard there is once again preponderance of the evidence, not clear and convincing evidence as it is in, in district court. So this, uh, th this proposal, though, has, uh, has, has created, I think, uh, a fair amount of controversy. It has, and let me jump in for a second. Part of the issue that you see on this is people are all over the place. Some people you talk to say, well, if a piece of prior art has been examined by the examiner below, clearly it deserves a higher standard. But if I'm bringing forth a piece of prior art that the examiner never looked at in a court proceeding, he ought not, he, there should be no presumption that he considered it and I should be entitled to the preponderance of the evidence standard. The problem is when you try a patent infringement case and you do not have infringement bifurcated from validity, you go through an infringement trial. And the infringement trial is all preponderance of the evidence. Preponderance of the evidence, does each and every limitation within the claim exist in the accused device or in the accused method? So the jury hears that for days and days and days. Preponderance of the evidence, preponderance of the evidence. Then you move forward after that more often than not into a validity challenge. And the first thing that the patentee tries to do is 
is they get their patent law expert up and he testifies about how great the patent office is and how in his 72 years they've never made a mistake on examining even one application and you know in 1922 when he wrote the patent act they knew how ingenious and you know and the jury's sitting there like you know wow this is you know this is fantastic and then they take their patent the patentee does and they walk over and they say the defendants are trying to do this with your pat patent and they throw it in the garbage can they jump up and down and then they show the big ribbon from the patent office and they said, look at how big this ribbon is. We would not have gotten this big ribbon if this thing wasn't great. And you know, and then they break out the preponderance of the, then they break out the presumption. The presumption is that these guys are all geniuses. And then the clear and convincing evidence comes out and it's this whole, you know, onslaught of presumptions built on presumptions. And, and I've had the opportunity to go and talk to the juries after trials are over and they say, look, the guy held up the patent and it had that big ribbon on it. And, you know, he told us how good the patent office was. And they have this really funny video in a lot of jurisdictions that they'll show about the patent office with this cheesy guy who talks about how, how the patent office operates. And sometimes judges will show that. At least there you put the jury completely asleep, and there's some great benefit to that. But, but, but you're facing a huge uphill battle here trying to explain why on the infringement trial that you've just sat through for 10 days it's a preponderance of the evidence. Now it's, to a juror, it's because the patent is valid, and you're going to have to really have a magic act to convince them otherwise. And so you know, there are, there are certain issues that are well worth considering here because of the dissonance that exists in the burdens that trying to explain these things to lay people and then trying to craft instructions at the end of the trial for the judge to give to the jurors for 45 minutes about patent law issues is a very challenging, uh, difficult issue. So this, this has been out there for a while and it's a very, very confrontational uh, issue within the patent bar and people are on every side of the fence with regard to it. Now I, I have to say that Blair's been working a lot of defendants cases lately. <laughs> and so he may, you know, he's, he has a, a very, uh, very strong view of, of, uh, of the advantage of the plaintiff uh, in making those kinds of arguments. And, and to be sure, there is some advantage there. On the other hand, after a patent has been examined, the applicant has, has gone through that process, has, has paid his or her fees, has obtained the patent. Shouldn't there be some advantage in that? Should, should, the, should, the, should the patentee then have to start over all again at ground zero and get no benefit of, of having the patent office closely and thoroughly examine that invention and say, yes, you do deserve a United States patent. And yes, we are going to give you one of those nice ribbons in this seal and all that. I mean, isn't that entitled to something? So I think, I, I think this issue was, uh, is really far from one-sided. Yes? Well, isn't one of the justifications for the disparity in the level is that the patent office is presumed to have skill in what they're doing. They, they are presumed the to have system, such skill. I mean, you know, you're using a, a, a lay jury. Yes, that's right. That's right. That, that is a part of the presumption. And the, the patent office is, is, is the expert, if you will, in, uh, in examining patents. That's their job. That's their purpose in life. We don't have a registration system in the United States where you simply go in and, and, and register your, your invention and get a patent. There is rigorous examination, and, and, and that should be entitled, I think, to, to some form of uh, deference in the, uh, in the system. They don't even give themselves deference, though. Because if you're being sued in the middle of the trial and you say, all right, let's stay the trial today before we move to the validity trial right now. I'm, I filed yesterday uh, a, a, an ex parte re-exam request. You go back on re-exam to the patent office and what do they do? They apply a preponderance of the evidence it's standard. I, I, exactly, because it's a re-exam. And that's part of the issue that, that they're pointing to, I think, when they're saying, you know, why, why the difference? And is it because the presumption is that they're skilled? Possibly, but you know, I mean, I don't know necessarily that we deserve to have uh, the confusion that's created by the different standards. I'd be fine if you said, let's make the standard clear and convincing evidence at the patent office. You know, Let, let's make the standard consistent throughout. You know, I'd be fine with that as well. It's just you know, more consistency would probably be helpful, I think, to everybody. Question down here. I think it's clearly true that the United States has a high standard of new, high level of new company development, innovation. If you compare that with France, which issues a patent with no presumption of validity, you'd be amazed at that difference. To vitiate the value of a patent cannot help the founding of new companies. Think of what that means for the country and the company and the economy. Well, now that, that's an interesting so point. Absolutely, yes. 
right, absolutely. Right. Ab absolutely. The, the, the FTC is, well, is approaching, approaching this, this with. <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. don't pin this. Don't pin this on me. <laughs> this, is, this is the FTC. I have nothing to do with the FTC. And the, the FTC's premise is that competition is aided by weakening patents. I mean, that, that is one of their fundamental premises in, in the course of these recommendations. And I think one can certainly dispute that, and one can point out that, that the, the purpose of, of patents, and, and there's a patent clause in the, in the Constitution, which is to, in the Constitution, to promote progress in the arts. And innovation. And, and innovation. And so that's what patents are all about. And I think one can certainly uh, make a very strong argument that by, by making strong patents available to worthy inventions, then that, that certainly creates innovation. That's the system that we've got for 200 years. You're not proposing it, but you're arguing in favor of it. It almost seems like you're both are. But be that as it may, argue your own position. In my view, it's almost catastrophic, disastrous to be sure. And what's the point? So if you cut out these lawsuits down the way or let somebody do something that might be prevented by some prison because they can't win their case under these existing standards, that's the barrier that lets small companies exist against big ones. And you're going to lower that barrier. For what purpose? Well, the FTC would say that in their view, you're, you're, you're enhancing competition. But again, it's not. It's, it, it's By anything I can understand, it seems actually ruinous. If, if you take invalid patents that have issued out of the system, they cannot not be used in an anti-competitive manner. Now, again, I'm not arguing this. This is the FTC's presumption. They're presuming that there are invalid patents in place that have issued because examiners do not have adequate resources. They then say that these improperly issued patents that are invalid are being used in the marketplace for anti-competitive purposes. So they're looking for ways to try to take them out of the marketplace. That's what this is all about. You know what I've seen of this, and I've watched litigation in this area. Almost no small inventor can stand it if it's really going to be broken by one of the big boys like GE. I know. MRI I know. Patent. And they can't stand it already. If you lower the barrier, you're going to lower the cost of GE for breaking the existing patent. You're arguing this on the basis of some justice or change in the rules. But I think it's going to come a crop across the Constitution because it's so granted to the inventor the exclusive rights to his inventions. Agreed. No, I agree. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And I think it won't fly. Now, it's kind of ruinous that it's even coming up. How long has this been taking away? Since early 2002. Yeah, so, yeah, that's when they started their discussions. The current head of the FTC is very, very behind this, and he's out publicly speaking all the time about it. This is political and irrelevant, but curious. Was he Bush appointee or? <laughs> I don't even know. But I, I, I do not know. I, I, don't know I, I, believe, I believe that he's a Bush appointee. The reason I mention that is there was a big push by the major companies to destroy small inventions because they were subsidizing patent office, let's get rid of that, which again pushes it in their camp. And this thing is a heavy push in their camp, which to me is disastrous. Well, certainly you want balance. There's no question. We have a system that's driven the country from wilderness to world power, and we're talking about changing it dramatically and fundamentally. Like the 1952 Patent Act did. And we changed that and we got rid of that. Mm -hmm. 1952 patent back, that whole key fall of this stuff was pushed back in the flash of genius. So there is political correction to this, no matter what the FTC is. Thank God for democracy. Right. But frankly, I'm startled that this thing is being proposed. Well, there, there is a fair amount of momentum behind it. Of course, th there are 10 of these recommendations, and I think it's unlikely that all of them are going to be approved. Right. And I, this is certainly one of the more controversial. The, the, pa the Patent Office supports a number of these recommendations already, but through not, not to. Exactly, through the commissioner. <laughs> there, there's, there's no question. No, no, no. I, I see no benefits, and I see dramatic possibility for danger to the economy of the country, which is already under pressure because of outsourcing one of the things we've got going is the ability to start small companies. And this will weaken that. That dominates to me the whole thing. And I see the, what appears to me the political background of it becomes even more startling. I'm going to pay attention to this. One. <laughs> well, now you are, so that's good. Yes. Uh, one question, and not to jump ahead, but it's, it's akin to this question here is uh, over the past 15, 20 years in practice, one, one can't help but uh, gain the impression that uh, um, what the Federal Circuit has given with one hand, it's taken away with the other. And to follow up, on, I guess, on Jim's comment back here, uh, see well, the standard of non-obviousness coming down quite a bit, uh, yet scope of uh, infringement being, uh, uh, scope of 
that they've contracted. Certainly, the written description requirement uh, becoming more onerous. And uh, I just wonder if it wouldn't be more beneficial to the small inventor, as well as to the large company, to uh, see the standard of non-obviousness come back a little stronger and issue fewer, more meaningful patents. Is that recommendation anywhere in here? Right, yes. and, that, and that's, that's a good point. And I've actually written quite a bit on this, so <laughs> I'm glad that we're moving in that direction. <laughs> The, the suggestion that the FTC is bringing forward is to bring the non-obviousness standard back to where it was. However, they'll have to drag the Federal Circuit along with them because the Federal Circuit is the reason that the standard is not where it was in 1950 and 1960 and even into the 1970s. And what has happened is this, this system has come to the point where the suggestion to combine has become very, very important in the analysis. And whether or not you like it, it's very difficult when you have two pieces of prior art under 103 to demonstrate that there is some type of suggestion to combine. What the Federal Circuit recently has delved into is an implicit suggestion to combine. And they're willing to consider an implicit suggestion to combine. Implicit motivation. That's a very, very vague and difficult concept for practitioners to figure out. And I don't know, it, it's a case dependent, in all honesty, sequence. It's very difficult to say implicitly in this instance it would have been combined explicitly in another instance it wouldn't have been combined. What the FTC says is let's assume that if there are two pieces of prior art that exist, that one of ordinary skill in the art, knowing of these two pieces of prior art, would combine them unless there is something teaching away in the prior art or in the industry or in their experience or some reason. I mean, if that standard is adopted, uh, you're right. I mean, that is a, a much tighter standard as far as obviousness is concerned. My view is that it would take the Federal Circuit to do that. I don't think that you can legislatively enact it because it's, it's a statute that's being interpreted. And, and so their recommendation is that the Federal Circuit look at this issue. You mentioned it would take the Federal Circuit to uh, do that, but uh, earlier you referred to the Supreme Court cases and what those seven, I forget the exact number of non-obvious Supreme Court cases, post-52, uh, but for what, U.S. v. Adams. That, that, that's, that, that, that's a very good point, and I've talked to a number of people recently who see obviousness as, as the potential new issue at the Supreme Court. Some people say claim construction, and some people say obviousness. So I, I, my view is that, that the likely issue will be this implicit motivation to combine, and whether that means that we're going to presume that one of ordinary skill would combine unless something instructs otherwise when you look at the art or to one of ordinary, if an expert comes forth and says, uh, puts forth a good reason why. You know, again, I'm, there are two different arguments to this, to this. Certainly, they make some very logical arguments that if the patent office employs this rigorously, truly obvious patents are less likely to issue. That would help everybody. There's no question. That would help the small independent inventors. That would help the larger companies that are out there as well. They also treat the commercial success test, although in my view, their treatment of the commercial success test is nothing different than what we already have in practice. They say that if you demonstrate a patent is commercially successful, it means that that's a secondary consideration that you can put forth for arguing that the patent is not obvious. All they say is, let's make sure that the commercial success is linked to the patentable aspect of the invention. Otherwise, it's not probative. It's, it has no relevance. And in my experience, most judges are already applying this standard out there from a pure evidentiary standpoint. I know the patent office already applies this standard as well. So, so I don't see their recommendation with regard to commercial success as being anything new or earth shattering. They make, they make no recommendation, the FTC makes no recommendation as to how this is to be implemented. Uh, that's, that if, if they're dealing with an implicit combination, that could certainly be difficult. And it, I don't see how, you know, without making a, some type of recommendation, it can be carried out. It'll be a battle of the experts, ultimately, is what it sounds like, which is what it already is at some level. Um, does the report seem to be um, issuing some of these recommendations in an industry-specific manner? 
Are they targeting certain industries? I are think they being so. sort of reactionary to certain public policy issues like gene patents and obvious Yes, yeah. yes. yes. They, they, they yeah. heavily mention several industries. One is biotech, another semiconductors, software. another software. But do they want these to be applied across the board for all they, technology? They would be applied across the board for all technology. They, they do, but interestingly enough, there's a long discussion of the industries and of the industry-specific concerns in the report. So, you know, on the one hand, there are in industry-specific concerns that are the genesis of a lot of the recommendations, but on the other hand, the recommendations are across the board, and I think there's some inconsistency in that. I haven't had a chance to read this report. I'm going to hunt it down. But does anybody in this room know how many hours the new examiner is allowed to complete an application? Is it 13? 13 for the training funds. 13.2 for the training ones, and it reduces as they advance. And try as the examining core has, they've got people who insist on decreasing productivity as it's called. Absolutely. By decreasing the number of hours of the examiner. Does anybody mention in this wonderful report by our Federal Trade Commission? One possibility to improve the standard of examination is to allow more time. For the yes, yes, yes. You, that that you, specific proposal is yeah. made. Also, you will be happy to know that they said that they believe that this, the, the current evaluation system of patent examiners should be modified as well. They think that the current evaluation system, which focuses on numbers, should be should be reevaluated and changed in a way that won't press down to the 13 hours per application. Now, none of their 10 recommendations deal specifically with that issue, but it's in the report and it's noted as an issue of concern. It's too bad because in my view, which has a certain strong element, so I should be aware, that this is the single greatest thing which is initiating the patent system was that idea that you've got, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's got 500 claims, as we heard, some of you may have heard in the previous one, but 500 claims, but three claims, you get 13.2 hours. Right. Now, this is an unsupportable position, yet they don't recommend it as one of their ten. Well, here's one close recommendation, <laughs> Rob. <Yes. laughs> yeah. It's uh, the closest that they get, okay? <laughs> right. And uh, as you can see, the, the FTC has recognized that providing adequate funding for the PTO to, to properly examine patents is a very important point. I think it's also interesting to recognize that these ten recommendations, uh, some of them really are, are Contradictory is perhaps not the right word, but if you, for example, if you if you increase the funding of the PTO and you improve the standard of examination, okay, then do you need to reduce the standard of proof required to show invalidity? Okay, if you bring the examination up to the point that that valid and and substantially only valid patents are issued, at that point, then have you satisfied the concern that overly broad patents are issued and that and that the presumption of uh, uh, validity is no longer uh, justified. I, I think you have. So, so there, there are really choices of approaches in these ten recommendations. I don't think it would be appropriate to implement all of them. It, it would be overkill. Again, if if the PTO is only issuing good patents, then 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 the the presumption of validity and requiring proof by clear and convincing evidence is, in my view, fully supported. And so this this approach, recommendation number four. Would, uh, would, would get at the problem of time and resources which are lacking at the PTO and would enable examiners to, to undertake the kind of examinations that they need to. It would improve the, the prior art collections available to examiners and it would certainly improve the quality of the patents that are issued uh, by the Patent Office. We have five minutes left and there are a number of issues in here that could really get us riled because there are some recommendations that are worse than what you have seen at this point. So what I propose is I'm going to run through the remaining six recommendations, op op open up the floor for a couple of questions, and then I'll give you the website information with regard to how you can download a copy of the report. There are summaries of the report. that are 20 pages long here on the desk. The report itself is 300 pages, so it's a, it's a, it's a lot of reading. The, the fifth recommendation is, and this one I'm sure you will not be all that happy with if you think about it, modifying the prior art citation rules during prosecution. And what the FTC is recommending is that 
somebody who files an application explains the relevance of every piece of prior art that they put in the application. I mean, talking about increasing cost of the patent process, that will dramatically spike the cost. They've also recommended that the examiners use the rule that allows them to request additional information with regard to the relevancy of prior art. My concern, just looking at that, having a litigation background in these issues is the statements that are made, of course, are going to have a stopple effect, and I just see all types of problems with that recommendation. Recommendation six, this one is nebulous, so we can get by it fairly quickly. Considering harm to competition before extending patentable subject matter. All right, well, that's, we don't know what that means, but that's what they recommend, yeah. so we'll see how that plays out. The seventh recommendation is publishing all patent applications 18 months after filing. That one does make a lot of sense, and I think that that would be, that would be helpful. They, they're already requiring that, in the, and the PTO is already on board with that as well. The eighth, Rob mentioned earlier, creating intervening rights and prior user rights. This is directly aimed at submarine patents. It's directly aimed at Lemelson. There's no question. They don't mention Lemelson in the report, but clearly that's what they're aiming at there. The ninth recommendation is requiring actual notice of willful infringement. And this one, at some level, to me, makes sense as well. What they say is that people don't read patents because they know they can be found to willfully infringe if they've seen the patent and read it before. And they say what that's doing is preventing people from taking advantage of the disclosure function of patents because they're being instructed not to look at patents in their industry. So they say, make a standard where you require actual notice. And the actual notice would be letting somebody know that you believe they infringe a patent. That would begin the willfulness period. That makes a lot of sense. Then I believe they put a controversial spin on it and they say, so that you're not blanketing, sending letters to everybody in the world, let's have a trade-off. And if you send a letter giving actual notice of infringement starting your willfulness timeline, allow at that point in time that to be, in every instance, a reasonable apprehension allowing a declaratory judgment of invalidity to be filed. Again, that's a little bit confrontational. That's a little bit interesting and controversial. We'll see where that one goes, although some of that seems to make sense. Uh, their tenth recommendation is kind of a summary of all of their other recommendations. And they basically just reiterate. And you'll, if you look at the report, you'll see that they hit the issue a thousand times, that they believe that the FTC and the Federal Circuit need to come together and need to be working together to ensure the anti-competitive instincts and making sure that everybody is watching after everybody. And they promise to fettle, file amicus briefs. They file to be more involved. And they promised to get involved at the patent office with ex parte uh, re-exams. So the FTC is sticking their nose into patent law. There's no question about it. And we are here to deal with it and well, to well, analyze it. Uh, let me just briefly sure. mention uh, another aspect uh, of a recommendation that we moved through very quickly. And that is the, uh, the recommendation to approve patent examination. One of the proposals is to implement the second pair of eyes approach, which has been successfully used in examining business method patents to take that to the semiconductor arts, to the, the software uh, art units, and to, uh, to biotech as well. Now, that, that really seems to have uh, a lot going for it. Uh, I, th I think everyone is pretty much in agreement that the second pair of eyes approach with respect to business method patents has been successful and that it could improve examination in these other areas. All right, let's open up the floor to questions. Um, do you think the FTC is hiding behind uh, uh, Shroud of the invalidity, validity. Uh, it sounds like you emphasize, you know, they're, they're concerned that there's a bunch of invalid patents out there. And the reason I say that is I'm wondering if the FTC hadn't already given the Federal Circuit the message because it took the doctrine of equivalence and threw it out the window after 30 <laughs> years. And if you want to reach your patent rights, the, the Federal Circuit has done it drastically already. So if, if, the, if the point is the FTC to weaken the patent rights, the Federal Circuit's done a damn good job already and just with the I, I, I agree with you that things are heading in that direction. And, and, and bear in mind that what the Federal Circuit is trying to do a lot is to provide certainty. That's what the, and in providing certainty, a lot of times what they're doing is getting rid of certain viable options for patentees, like under the doctrine of equivalence. 
And, and so you are seeing more and more of this, there's no question. And clearly the Federal Circuit's aware of the FTC recommendation, and it would not be you know, unfathomable to see some of their recommendations be uh, carried into law. There's and you, no question. you do have to bear in mind the, the FTC's viewpoint. Their, their, their purpose in life is to prevent <laughs> exactly. monopolies. Right, and they see patents as a limited monopoly. They don't see the that. Well, that's right. They, they that's don't right. see patents as a property right as such, but a limited monopoly and one to be kept limited. So I think I think you're seeing that that approach uh, manifested in, in in some of these uh, some of these uh, suggestions. Grant, how um, exactly is the second pair of eyes um, really going to be implemented? Because having worked at the patent, patent office. All, mo most of the patent office, I would say, are junior examiners, and all of them have uh, all their applications get looked at by primary examiners, anyways. The bulk of the time that is spent on an application is looking for prior art. I mean, once we have a good prior art, the the rejection or whatever can be can be written in a short amount of time. And so, really, it's it's the amount of time that's required to look at an application that's really needed. And is the second pair of eyes going to get the same amount of time to find prior art, or I mean, because the, the patent office is already bogged down as it is. You know, so I, I don't know all work? the mechanics of the program, but my understanding is that additional time is provided, of course, and that and the second pair of eyes is is to be an experienced examiner who can come in and give a, a meaningful look at the uh, at the action and and give meaningful review and improve the quality of. But that. but, so but it's not what you're saying, right? Well, what you're saying, saying is a better solution. Right. You're saying let's let's double the time, right. you know, looking for the prior art and really yeah. examining. Because exactly. it's not really the it's not really the rejection that you're you're looking at. It's, it's the good prior prior art that's required. Sure. And so having another pair of eyes is not really going to help. I, I I agree with you. Don. Well, I, I, I think I, of the business yes. method and software area where it was initiated. It's a three examiner panel who reviews yeah. cases that were given a notice of allowance by the primary examiner. That 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 sit down and review it independently. But, but, but before it goes Don, do they, they examine it? Do they re-examine it basically from, you know, the... No, not from scratch. Yeah, they I didn't think so. They, they right. take a look at it and give it a straight face test. Okay. You know, if in their experience collectively, they see that, that there's probably prior art out there, I think what they do is they send it back to the examiners and say, you go find a piece of prior art that says this because we think it's out there. Right. Yeah, I had examiners tell me that right. before. Uh, there's a the needle in the haystack. Withdrawn. I can't tell you why yet. Right. I haven't done the search. Right. <laughs> 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 it back to their evaluation, too, because they're, they're, they're motivated to get one rejection and then go to allowance. And so they're, they're, they're trying to get the allowance, and then, then this other second of I, second test is, well, no way, you're not getting allowance. Ken. Go tell me why. Uh, I mean, as, as you well know, and uh, for all your experience in this study on this issue globally, I mean, this is not the first report to come along and make a comment either specifically or globally on the U.S. system or other systems throughout the world or compare the uh, other systems. And uh, uh, I don't know how they selected their 300 plus uh, commentators and uh, their submitters, but uh, based on your experience, and not to unduly put you on the spot, based on your experience, if you were receiving this report back as a response to an exam question, comment on the patent system. What kind of grade would you give it? Uh, I, I would I would give it at best a C, at best a C. I, I mean it's it's the effort was definitely a worthy effort. You can look at the people who are talked to, you can look at the hearing transcripts, but the end result, the work product, the 300 page product, makes a lot of assumptions that are not supported. Uh, they, they, it seems to be very focused and driven, outcome oriented, and, and when you read it, that's what you see. And, and so I don't believe that it's fair and objective, and that's why I wouldn't give it more than a C. I, I might give it a bit better grade than that. I think, I think, I think some, of the, some of the suggestions are, are right on the money and appropriate. Some of them are, are over the top. What, what it's helpful for is to encourage thought and discussion about the process and about whether things ought to change. Um, it, it's, its arguments and its recommendations uh, probably leave a little bit less to be desired, in, in my opinion. So, so that's kind of how I see it. But certainly it has sparked a lot of discussion and, and a lot of debate, and, and it's been very helpful from that perspective. Would your grade change if you graded it on a scale and compared it to other countries? I think so. Yeah, probably. I, I'm pretty what harsh. I'm, pre I'm, I'm pretty harsh because of, of what they are trying to do, what the FTC is trying to do to the patent system without having uh, 
adequate underlying experience, the people who worked on the, the report to, to draw from, you know, to make that recommendation. I think that that's, you know, so like Rob said, I, I view it as an antitrust spin on patent law. And, and, and from that perspective, I find that very difficult to, you know, to accept. So if I, if I graded it relative to other countries, it would probably be higher in all honesty. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, well, thanks. Happy Friday evening.